here. I told you that I just I felt strongly that um, I should begin with fundamentals, so that later on when I talk about the characteristics of a Christian or I talk about what it means to be a Christian or what the seven things are you have to know to be a Christian, we all got that. We all understand and we know what we're talking about. So, but each message is built on the last one and the last two that I've done have been trying to help you understand how to know for sure that you are saved. And there are the four basic characteristics that Jesus taught are the marks of a believer, are unconditional love, unconditional forgiveness, thank you, unconditional grace, kindness, in other words, and today, generosity. Now, when we talk about generosity, in and of itself, that means that we're going to have to talk about and money makes people uncomfortable when you talk about it. And I want to assure you, if a pastor is any kind of integrity whatsoever, it makes him uncomfortable to talk about money. Do you know why? Because you pay me. <laughs> and I'm teaching you about how to be generous to God because that's the mark. That's who we are. And so I'm asking you to be generous to but I'm not asking for a raise. Let's get that out of the way, okay? <laughs> You pay me very well, we live well, we have a nice house, that's it, thank you. I don't need no more for now. <laughs> but it makes me uncomfortable as well. But there's a principle that is extremely important for us to grasp as believers. And this sermon is for believers. Okay? The promise that I'm going to give you that's from the Word of God is for believers and believers only. We'll talk today about generosity. The message comes from 2 Corinthians 9 1. Oh, I, I couldn't resist, but nobody got that joke. Uh, 2 Corinthians? Okay. It's a political commentary, never mind. Today's message comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 1 through 15. And I want to set up where we're going by explaining to you what he's talking about. Okay? The, the essence of the problem is that the church in Jerusalem, which is the first organized church, many of the members of that church have lost everything. They've been persecuted. They've been thrown out of their homes. They've been lost their, their way to make a living or they've lost their possessions. And so they come into the house of the Lord and there are wealthy people, people of means who haven't lost everything. And those who have are coming to those who have not and vice versa to say, we need help. Well, you can only do that so long in any given church family, and pretty soon you tap them out. And that's what's going on in the church in Jerusalem. They want to help, but their brothers and sisters have just about tapped them out, and they got not much left. Now, couple that with the fact that Paul has been planting these churches out there, and they're Gentile churches. You know, Gentile, that's what you and I are. Non-Jewish. And those early Christians believed that first you had to be Jewish to be Christian. And Paul's planting these churches out there, and they're Gentile churches, and that's, that's causing a lot of grief. So Paul sees a way to solve two problems with one stroke. I'll go out to the churches I planted, and I'll encourage them to take up an offering, and we'll bring it back to the home church, and the home church will see we're all brothers and sisters in Christ, regardless of our ethnic heritage. And that's what he's going to talk about. Now, the church at Corinth, there have been two people designated to take up the offering, and these two people are going to take it to Jerusalem. But you know, the Corinthian church has been so generous that the trustees of the Corinthian church said, you know, maybe we just ought to keep that for a rainy day. And this is what triggers Paul's letter, okay? Hear now the word of the Lord. For it is superfluous for me to write to you about this ministry, that is, the collecting of the money. For I know your readiness, of which I boasted about you to the Macedonians, namely that Achaia has been prepared since last year, and your zeal has stirred up most of them. But I have sent the brethren in order that our boasting about you may not be empty in this case, so that as I was saying, you may be prepared. In other words, have the money gathered up. Otherwise, if any of the Macedonians come with me and find that you are unprepared, we, not to speak of you, will be put to shame by this conference. 
So I thought it necessary to urge the brethren, meaning the church, that they would go on ahead and arrange beforehand your previously promised bountiful gift so that the same would be ready as a bountiful gift and not affected by covetousness. Let's just keep that to the rainy day. That's what he's referring to. Now, I say this. Now this I say. He who spare, sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must do just as he has purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or uncompulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that always, having all sufficiency in everything, you may have an abundance for every good deed. As it is written, he scattered abroad and gave to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. Now, he who supplies the seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in everything for all liberality, which through us is producing thanksgiving to God. For the ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but is also overflowing through many thanksgivings to God. Because of the proof given by this ministry, they will glorify God for your obedience and to your confession of the gospel of Christ and for the liberality of your contribution to them and to all, while they also, by prayer on your behalf, yearn for you because of the surpassing grace of God in you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Amen. Now there are two verses in there that the Holy Spirit immediately brought to my attention. And that's where we're going to focus. Now this I say, he who spares sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Now, I, I know that most of you are not familiar with farming. And so I'm going to take a couple of minutes to explain the reaping sowing process to you. Okay? Now, when you, if you want to have a good harvest, you need to... Pastor, we get... <laughs> you, you mean there's farmers in this group? Well, okay, well, maybe I can say that you so can. You get that concept, all right? So, the one, there's, this is an analogy, obviously, okay? He's talking about physical sowing by a farmer. But he's talking about us using our financial resources to benefit God. And here's the promise that I want you to hear. For believers only, okay, he who sows sparingly reaps sparingly. He who sows bountifully reaps bountifully. There's no adverb, there's no adjective, there's no, there's no cause, no if, ands, or buts. Okay? Now, farmers, if you sow abundantly, are you guaranteed an abundant harvest? Yes or no? No. Because you can sow all the seed in the world and a frost kill all those puppies when they just break, and that's it. You've got to start all over again. But spiritually, we are guaranteed, guaranteed, if we sow bountifully, we will reap bountifully. Now, you will come upon some commentators who say what Paul is talking about is if we, are, we live Christian lives here, we're going to go to heaven. But that's not what it says. It says if you sow bountifully here, you will reap bountifully here. I do not want to come across as a prosperity preacher this morning. Okay? Prosperity preachers tell everybody that God wants to bless you with everything, big house, nice car, all that stuff. All you got to do is just ask Him. It's not what Scripture says. And that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying believers, one of the marks of a believer is a generous heart. And God promises, if you give generously, He will give generously to you. All right? Now, if that is true, there ought to be some historical evidence of that. Right? We ought to be able to look in history somewhere and find one or two people, at least, who can prove the truth of that accident. <clears throat> How about Henry P. Cromwell? Has anybody ever heard of Henry P. Cromwell? 
Once upon a time, he was called the breakfast king. All right? In today's world, if I say breakfast king, you're most likely going to think of Burger King. But once upon a time, this man Cromwell was known as the breakfast king. Now, here's his story. When he was a little boy, he contracted tuberculosis. And they told him that he couldn't go to school. They told him he wasn't strong enough to go outside. And so he had to stay inside. And at the time that Cromwell was a little boy, the only form of entertainment in his house was the radio. That's a long time ago. Just the radio. So he would listen to the radio day in and day out. As a consequence, one Sunday he heard a sermon preached by Dwight L. Moody. The message spoke to him so deeply that he accepted Jesus Christ through the radio no one watching or listening. And so he asked God if he could become a preacher. And he went to the doctor. When his parents took him to the doctor the next time, he said to the doctor, I'm going to be a preacher. And the doctor said, you're not strong enough. They'll kill you. And so the little boy was crushed. <clears throat> and he said, well, Lord, if you can't, if you don't want me to be a preacher, can I be your business man? If you will help me create a run of business, I'll give the majority of the money I make to you. As Cromwell went into his teenage years, his doctor said, you're now well enough to go outside and work. And so he took a job as a, working at a mill in Ravenna, Ohio. Eventually he bought the mill. The mill made its living by grinding, or, or gr grinding oats and drying them. It was run by Quakers originally. Eventually, he began to do, produce a breakfast product called Quaker Oats. Eventually, it was eaten by millions of people around the world. Cromwell became a millionaire. And as the money started to flow in, he made a promise to God. He said, in the first year, I'll give you 50% of everything I made. After 10 years, he was giving him 60% of everything he made. After 20 years, he gave him 70% of everything he made. And no matter how much he blessed God, God continued to bless him. He bought the Perfection Stove Company. He went from being a millionaire to a multi-millionaire. And he was giving God 90% of everything he made. And no matter how much he gave God, God continued to bless him. In the course of his life, Henry P. Cromwell gave more than two-thirds of everything he owns because of Jesus Christ, and he died with millions upon millions in the bank. How do you explain that? God is generous to those who are generous to him. That's what it means by so sparingly, reap sparingly, so bountifully, reap bountifully. Probably Cromwell was the only guy in American history that we can trace back and find that that's true, except that we also could talk about a guy named William. A guy named William, who, <clears throat> towards the end of the 1800s, wanted to become a sea captain. Back in the 1800s, the little boys wanted to be a sea captain like most little boys want to be an NFL quarterback today. Okay? And so he, he, was, he was a real spindly little guy, and he, he didn't, you know, it, it had to be pretty healthy and pretty muscular to be on a ship. So he goes, packs a little backpack, and runs away from home, as a young teenager, he goes down to the docks and he tries to talk his way onto one of the ships. And he runs into a guy who, who runs a canal boat up across the river. And he said to him, kid, you're never ever going to make a living on, on a boat. And he said, well, I, I work for my dad in the soap business and I hate making soap and I just wanted to get away. I wanted to have a great adventure on the sea. And the captain said, yeah, the, the sea will kill you, son. He said, you know, somebody is going to be the greatest soap maker in New York City. Why don't you be that guy? He said, in fact, maybe God has created you to be the greatest soap maker in New York City. And he led this kid to the Lord. And so when he left the canal boat, the, the old man said to him, be a good man. Give your heart to Christ always and pay the Lord all that belongs to him every week, whether you think you can afford it or not. Make an honest product. Give a full pound for a full pound measure. And God will bless you. William became the greatest soap maker 
in New York City. In fact, he became the greatest soap maker in America. His first year, he gave God 20%, second year, 30 the third year, 40 and every year thereafter, 50%. William's last name was Colgate, and the name of this company is Colgate Palmolive. How can you explain that someone would give away 50% of everything that they make and they get so much more, they keep getting blessed? It's a promise in Scripture. To those who are generous to God, John, God will be generous to them. Is there anyone else we could talk about? There was a man, those of you who are under the age of 50 will not know what I'm talking about, but those of you who are over 50, when I say mentholatum, you know what I'm talking about? Uh-huh. I'm going to talk, tell you about the guy who invented that. His name was Albert Hyde. Albert Hyde had an, an enormous ability, a knack for making money, but as fast as he made it, he spent it. He could never get ahead. And he wanted nothing to do with church. He didn't believe in God's existence, but he fell in love with this really pretty girl who only had one requirement of those men she dated. She insisted that they go to church with her. And so Albert Hyde went to church with her faithfully while they were courting, and one day he heard the gospel in a way that he could not deny. And so he became convinced that what he was doing wrong was spending all the money on himself. And so he started spending money that he made, and he started giving it back to the church. <clears throat> and then one night, and he had an idea about something came to him while he was sleeping, a formula for helping to relieve the common cold. Eventually he patented it, and he called it mentholatum. The product was extremely well received. He gave away millions and millions of dollars. His product continued to sell. And the more he gave away, the more God blessed him. He died at the age of 87. He had been an amazingly generous, generous benefactor, and he left an estate worth almost a half a million dollars. Is there any truth to the Bible? Is there any truth to this promise that those who are generous to God, God will be generous to? Are there other stories? There's all kinds of them. A kid named Walter Johnson was in his teens. He thought he knew everything about everything. He got fired by a sawmill operator. The sawmill operator said, quote, you'll never amount to anything because you're a lying, thieving, miserable excuse for a human being, unquote. That's kind of, that's an exit interview in today's world. <laughs> that made the kid mad. His name was Wallace Johnson. <clears throat> he wandered the streets of town trying to figure out what he was going to do and trying to process all that information. He found himself on the steps of a, of a church that was open. It was evening, he went in, he sat in a dark, empty church, and as luck would have it, the vicar came in to trim the candles and found this kid in there, asked him what was going on. One thing led to another, and he led him to Jesus Christ. And he told the kid, he said, from this day forward, be as much of a man like Jesus Christ as you possibly can, and don't forget to thank God by giving him a tenth of everything that you make, unquote. Wallace Johnson walked out of that building, to, walked down the street, saw a sign in an inn that said, help wanted. He went to work in that little hotel, and he was very good at it. Eventually, a man, a banker stayed in that hotel, was very impressed by this young man. He said, if you ever want to start your own chain or your own hotel, I will, I will finance you. And so he did. Wallace Johnson's company today is known as Holiday Inn. He gave away 10% of everything he made, and he died a millionaire. Is there any truth to the word of God? Do you believe that God is generous to those who are generous to God? Or is that just a myth? Is that some kind of folktale? Is that something that preachers preach to you? Can you imagine what your life would be like if you changed your attitude towards money? If you saw the money as belonging to God, not to you? <coughs> that is actually, in fact, God's loan to you that you will pay back eventually? God is generous to those who are generous to Him. Years ago, a young man began a small cheese business in Chicago. His company didn't do well. He was deeply in debt. He couldn't understand what he was doing wrong. 
and claimed to be a Christian, and the Christian friend said to him, you, you don't understand. It's not your cheese business. It's God's. Why don't you sign it over to him and work for him? And so this kid created a trust, and he gave all the business to the trust, and put 50% of everything that the prophets made, gave to the trust went to charity, to some kind of godly uh, business. And as soon as he did that, within a month of him signing everything over to the trust, is the America developed a taste for processed cheese. You want to know what this kid's name is? J.J. Kraft. He gave away millions of dollars. And he died a multimillionaire. You want me to go on? There's 108 stories of America's founders that I can tell you that says the same thing over and over and over and over. Those Christians who are generous to God, John, God was generous to them. It is not a fairy tale. It is not some crazy myth. If you want to understand why God doesn't bless you, there's one of two reasons why he won't bless you. Either you have yet to make a profession of faith to Jesus Christ and give your heart to him. That's the, that's the first barrier. And the second barrier is those of us, those, of, those who hang on to their money in tight fists like that, okay? And you hold out your hands and you ask God to bless you, what's going to happen? Where can you hold God's blessings if you hang on to your money so tightly that you got fists? How can God bless you, right? How can he bless you? He blesses you when you let go of it. He blesses you when you empty your hands. I had an old friend in, in West Virginia. He said, he said, you know, God gives to us with a coal shovel. You're probably not miners, so you don't want a coal shovel. But coal shovel is about that big and about that deep. He said, God blesses us with coal shovels, and we give out a teaspoon. God is generous to those who are generous to him. It is a promise in Scripture. It is proven in American history. It is proven in people's lives. I'm not going to do this, but if I ask those of you who tithe to raise your hand and tell me how many days you haven't had food on the table or been able to pay the light bill, I, wouldn't, I don't think there would be a hand raised in the house. Because if you are generous to God, God will be generous to you if you are to leave this power heads. Holy Father, would you impart this into their heads and hearts and our minds and our spirits, including mine, in such a way that we don't look at money as ours. We don't look away as we've got to keep it all for a rainy day, but understand that the, that the word picture that you gave Paul was not only will you give a harvest to feed the family of the farmer, but you will give them enough harvest to plant seed again and benefit others. May we understand and, and, and remember that you will be generous to those who believe in you who are generous to you. These things I ask in the holy and blessed name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I'm not going to pick that up now, but I'd like to have it later. <laughs>